Thank you, Lavinia. Um, welcome to Connolly Forum. It's really nice to see people out there uh, on a very cold night in December. I'm glad that we have such a crowd. Um, I'm uh, the co-chair of the Green Party here in New York State. Uh, John asked me to introduce Peter, I think probably because we have the same name. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to, um, uh, as, a, as introducer, um, you kind of invoke my privilege to speak just for a couple minutes on the topic at hand. Uh, and also I found out at dinner that Peter, like myself, is a frustrated academic. Um, and I know that uh, at a certain point in my career, uh, I was very interested in uh, researching and writing about uh, what he's going to discuss, kind of this future potential post-capitalist world. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting and really important to start having this type of discussion. I'm glad that we have so many people here tonight uh, to talk about it. Uh, for a really long time, uh, it seemed like nobody wanted to talk about it. You have to go back into uh, history to take a look at, um, you know, what what the future might bring. So I remember, you know, reading books and, uh, you know, kind of assigning them to students things like Looking Backwards, Herland, uh, dystopias like We or Ecotopia, and then probably seen movies like Logan's Run or uh, watch Star Trek, which is really about, I think, as, as I'll say, is really about the socialist or communist future where we all wear jumpsuits. Um, <laughs> but they're nice jumpsuits. Uh, but, I, but I think it's, it's really interesting and important uh, because it looks like, you know, hopefully within our lifetimes or at least within the next century, we are going to be talking about what comes after. Um, and this kind of thinking and this kind of writing is important to get us there, uh, to start having that conversation as a left that hasn't really done it in a really long time. I mean, Marx talked about it more than people claim that he talked about it. If you go back into a lot of his works, um, he did talk about it in, in places like Capital and writings on the Paris Commune and, and older works like the German ideology or a contribution to a critique of political economy. You can go back and look at this stuff. And he's using historical materialism to discuss what socialism or communism might look like. Um, because, you know, he was very interested in, in historical materialism is very useful in looking at the social and economic relations of production uh, in the past and in the present. Um, but because it's an attempt to do so scientifically, if you extrapolate out, um, you can say, well, this is what things might look like. And it doesn't have to be done in a fantastical way, as I think we'll see. Um, you know, what Peter's going to say, these are four very possible futures. Two of them could be really uh, good, and two of them could be pretty terrifying. Or at least one of them is pretty terrifying. Um, but again, you know, I think that uh, we're starting to see more people talk about it. Um, you know, there are some academics, too, who are talking about it. Um, people like Emanuel Wallerstein, I know, who are saying, you know, this system is coming to an end. Um, so what's going to happen next? Uh, you, you know, we're going to see all the old crap come back, as, as Mark said. Uh, problems of underconsumption and overproduction. Uh, I, I think we'll see. Uh, are we going to have a hierarchical world or a democratic one? Um, and I think that's really a question for this generation and the next. Uh, I think it's really going to be... Uh, uh, an open question. So I don't want to go on too much, but I think it's really interesting. I think it's a really important book. I think you should t uh, pick it up. I think you should um, uh, take a look at it, and hopefully we'll, we'll start this discussion here. Um, so uh, I will, through the miracle of technology, uh, explain why we call this the James Connolly Forum. Uh, James Connolly came to the United States in 1902 uh, and moved to Troy in 1903, setting up house at 96 Ingalls Avenue, a few blocks from where this forum takes place. He worked for the Metropolitan Insurance Company until a recession caused the firm to falter. While here, he was active in the Socialist Labor Party, where he engaged in a notable dispute with its leader, Daniel DeLeon, over the utility of fighting for wage increases. He was for this. And other questions. As most of you know, when he returned to Ireland, he played a leading role in great labor conflicts like the Dublin lockout of 1913 and led the Irish Citizen Army in its <coughs> uprising against the British rule in 1916. He was executed by the British as a result. Today he is recognized as one of the great socialist leaders of the 20th century. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter. He's, uh, as I said, a frustrated academic in sociology. He's an editor and contributor to the Jacobin Magazine. 
and he's the author of Four Futures, Life After Capitalism. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Connolly Forum. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for, for coming out on a, on a cold night. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to be doing a little bit of drawing, and I think I have a loud voice, so if everyone can hear me, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to use the mic, if that's okay with everybody. You can hear me. Um, so, yeah, so the book I wrote, Four Futures, uh, <laughs> I'll try to give a sense of what it's about and what, it, what, it, what I was trying to do with it, and then we can have a, have a back and forth and a conversation. Uh, I've done a few of these talks since the election. Uh, in most of them, I felt obligated to begin with Donald Trump. Uh, tonight, I'll start a little bit closer to home because this afternoon, John brought me over to the Momentum uh, picket line uh, and introduced me to some of the strikers who were struggling over there uh, in one of the remaining uh, you know, uh, big industrial employers in this region. I live not so far from here in Newburgh where we have basically none of it left. Uh, and these, you know, like talking to some of the people on that line, you would, you would hear people say, you know, this plant would never get put here today. This stuff, you know, it's a, you know, they can see that it's a, the, the, these kinds of, this kind of employment is dying out, and why is that? And this is where it brings us back to Trump, uh, because he would say, well, those jobs are in China, those jobs are in Mexico, and I'm going to bring them back with my whatever magic deal-making ability or whatever. Uh, and, you know, globalization and offshoring is a thing, but the other thing that is very real in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of these cases is uh, mechanization, autom automation, robotization uh, of this employment. Do you want me to use the mic? Or? No, i just put it over there so it helps a little bit. All right. Um, and, the, you know, the fact is manufacturing in some ways, is, in some cases, is actually coming back to the United States for various reasons, but it requires very few workers. Uh, it's, it's highly automated work. And so this brings me to where I started this book, is this, this anxiety about, about automation, which goes, runs through the entire history of capitalism. It's not a new thing. It comes up again and again and again. Uh, there's the story, the folk tale of John Henry, the steel driving man in the 19th century, as some of you may know, uh, who is a railroad worker who encounters the steam-powered drill and tries to race against it and drops dead trying to do so. That's a fable of workers trying to compete against the machines and losing. So that's one side of it. But the other side of it is something that in the socialist tradition and the Marxist tradition that I come from is that this is a terrifying possibility, but it's also a source of hope. Capitalism has produced this incredibly productive economy, and if it could be put to work for us, for the needs of the masses of humanity, rather than for the profits of a few, this is the road to utopia. And so that's my starting point, or that's one of my starting points, is Marx. The other one, uh, as, as Peter uh, you know, Maybe you guessed it is uh, is science fiction Star Trek. I was I was a big Star Trek fan growing up. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the series. And that show, Star Trek: The Next Generation in particular, was what I regarded as a portrayal of a communist society, a society in which they had the technology that basically liberated people from labor. Um, so this book is an attempt to put together those two things: the Marxism and the science fiction to talk about what would happen if it's true that we are, we are more and more automating things, we are more and more creating the possibility of doing without human labor. What comes out of that? What are the possibilities? And so that puts me in conversation with what, what's called sort of, you know, futurism, the people who want to write books that say this is what the world's going to be like in 20 years, or this is what, you know, robots mean for us. And I don't want to get too, I don't want to do that because, you know, as Peter's director said that Marx himself, you know, and other socialists talked about what the future would be like. But at the same time, Marx also had a famous line where he said, it's not, up, it's not for us to write recipes for the kitchens of the future. Uh, which is for two reasons. One of which is that your recipe is almost always going to turn out to be wrong. 
you know, as Yogi Berra supposedly said, a prediction is hard, particularly about the future. Um, <laughs> but also because if you believe, as I believe that, you know, a, the future I want, the socialist future that I want, is one that must be democratically decided upon by mass movements of people, that's in contradiction to the idea that you can predict in advance how it will turn out. So how can I talk about the future without falling into that futurist trap of pretending that I know what's going to happen? And this is where I tried to use science fiction, tried to use kind of the tools of speculative fiction to sketch out possibilities rather than inevitabilities. And so this is where I'm going to start, start drawing pictures. So I start the book with this premise. Suppose we could automate everything. Going back to Star Trek. In Star Trek, they have a machine called the Replicator, where you tell it what you want, and it just makes it for you. Captain Jean-Luc Picard says, tea, Earl Grey, hot. There's a little shimmer, and then the cup of tea appears. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, you, you could imagine that today's, like, 3D printers are the incredibly crude, like, precursors of this future technology that can make everything for you. They have that. They have free energy of antimatter or something or other. Um, so imagine you have that. The question that then becomes, what kind of a society do you get? And the Star Trek world sort of assumes, well, you just inevitably get this free, you know, freewheeling common society where if you want to go get in a spaceship and fly around meeting aliens, you can, but you don't have to. You can basically do whatever you want. But then the Marxist side of me comes back and says, well, wait a minute. Just because you have the technology doesn't mean that the social relations are going to be there to allow everyone to realize the potential of that technology, just as now we have a highly automated economy that benefits the 1% and not us. So this is where the four futures first started to get sketched out. I'm like, OK, you have this axis that you have to think about, where on one end is equality. So you might pour my handwriting. And on the other end is hierarchy. Right? This is just the axis that I call class struggle. This is Whatever happens are the benefits and, and also the scarcity is going to be shared out equally or is it going to be monopolized by a tiny elite the way it is today. And then, as I was sort of developing this, this concept, you know, somebody said to me, well, what about, what about climate change? What about the environmental crisis? What about what's happening in the earth right now? Even if you have the replicator, even if you have that free energy, Maybe we can't all have just as much as we want, uh, because not because of a shortage of human labor, but because of a limitation of the Earth's ability to support us. So then I needed another axis, I realized, uh, the axis of ecology. And in that axis, you have on one end scarcity, and on the other end, you have abundance. And so again, scarcity here, we're still assuming you have the replicators, you don't need human labor, you don't need any of that, but you still, you know, you still have to think about the carbon cost of things, the pollution, you know, the use of materials. Whereas in the abundance end, we've, we've sort of figured out a way around that. We've gone to renewable energy, we've figured out better ways to recycle materials, all of that kind of stuff. And so, I use that to sort of spin out for what the sociologist Max Weber called ideal types, kind of these like kind of toy model societies of what would happen if you went in the four boxes that are implied by this like two by two diagram, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the point of doing that, and I and in the book I talk about it in terms of both using research based on real world things that are happening now and also using illustrations from speculative fiction. <coughs> The point of doing that is to, is to say, basically, that like all science fiction, what I'm talking about are things that are happening today. Uh, it's, a, it's talking about a speculative future in order to illuminate particular aspects of the present. So all four futures are all, also our present. And I'm trying to like, pick out and isolate aspects of that present in a way that I, is hopefully useful in understanding it. So we start out with the, I'll start out with uh, the fun part. Um, we have equality, we have abundance. Again, this is the communist Star Trek future, and I do call this communism. This is communism not in the Soviet Union sense, but in the original Marxist sense of from each according to her ability to each according to his need. 
you do not are not required to involuntarily labor because society has transcended the need for that. And so what you do with your time is whatever is fulfilling to you. And so the, the challenge of that like, chapter of the book is actually to try to make that interesting to talk about. Because a lot of people hear that and they say, okay, well, that's, that's utopia, it's the end of history, all our problems are solved, what's, what's the talk about? It'd be nice if we could get there. You know, I don't believe in it, but it'd be nice if we could get there. Um, I try to sort of say there's all kinds of actually, I would say, better problems that we could have if we didn't have the big problem that capitalism presents for us today. Um, and I talk about the way in which there are little pockets of sort of communism that exist in the world around us. You know, it could be, you know, in some ways it could be something like the James Connolly Forum that people <laughs> work on even when they're not making money for it. It could be Wikipedia, it could be your community garden. Uh, and those projects have their own contradictions and conflicts that are not directly related to capitalism. You know, I talk about Wikipedia where if you research it, you find it's full of like weird, you know, feuding and sectarian backbiting and sexism and all kinds of crap. Um, and that stuff doesn't just go away overnight even if, you know, we are no longer dependent upon wage labor. Um, but at least if those kinds of struggles, those kinds of the hierarchy, the status hierarchies that arise, all of the kinds of things that happen in project, in any project of that sort, um, are easier to deal with when they're not bound to that one master capitalist hierarchy of money. Of what, of what does this mean for my ability to earn a living? So that's the kind of idea that I explore in that chapter through things like uh, this novelist, Cory Doctorow, who also runs a, the website Boing Boing, has a novel about people in a basically post-scarcity society who come together to voluntarily uh, take over Disneyland. And it's like the conflicts that arise in the course of that project. Right? <laughs> so that's my attempt to sort of portray like the post-scarcity and post-class you know, uh, post uh, future. Now, on the other hand, uh, and this is where this whole project actually started for me, is again, asking this question, what if we have the technology of Star Trek but we don't have the social relations, we still have a class society, what then? Uh, workers are not necessarily needed to produce things, but you still have people uh, who control the property and control the money, and they want to continue to do so. Um, so how do you maintain a class society? And you might say, well, that's, why, why would you? It's superfluous. You don't, if everybody can have as much stuff as they want, what's the point of maintaining a class society? But the thing is, and I think Donald Trump is an excellent example of this, for rich people, a lot of them, Power is what it's about. Power is its own reward. Power over others. They want to maintain that. It's not about having stuff. For a certain point, another million dollars doesn't mean anything in terms of buying more stuff. It's about power. And so how do you maintain that power? And so the scenario I sketch out here is the world I call rentism, uh, which is, this is mostly about intellectual property. So, Again, we go back to this idea of like the Star Trek replicator. You can tell it to make anything you want, except in this world, every, all of those patterns, all of those things that can be replicated, are, somebody has the rights to that, just like they have the right to music or medicines in our world. So you have to pay a licensing fee every time you make something. Uh, just like it's illegal to download a song without paying for it, even though it costs basically nothing to copy that song. Uh, and so, I sort of try to go through what that world looks like and the problems that arise mostly from the fact that you're going to have economic stagnation and underemployment because of the fact that you don't need workers to do anything other than enforce the property claims of the people that own the rights to the patterns, uh, you know, make new patterns, advertise new patterns. But fundamentally, how do you get people how do you maintain a class system that is not fundamentally based on human labor? Uh, and yeah, go through that with some, some, other, some other fictional examples like uh, the novelist Charles Strauss's novel Accelerando, uh, Warren Ellis's uh, graphic novel Transmetropolitan, another good example of this, um, of, what, of the weird pathologies of this world. Uh, all right, so next box, going back to uh, scarcity world. 
where the ecological question looms large. How do we deal with it? The egalitarian answer to this is, this is what I call socialism. And so I use socialism and communism as the terms here because in a certain traditional kind of Marxist framework, You've, it's, it's sometimes said that socialism is when you have a state that kind of plans and organizes the economy that eventually you know, withers away and gives way to a truly sort of almost anarchist utopia of communism. Uh, in, a, in an ecologically scarce society, you need some form of planning. Uh, organ, you know, dealing with the ecological crisis requires planning, not however of exactly the sort, same sort as the kind of economic planning that we associate with, the, for example, the Soviet Union. Because that kind of planning was planning labor. It was planning who does what job, who makes what, what gets made. But in this world, remember, we're still assuming uh, the sort of replicator technology. The problem is that you can't just let people replicate as much crap as they want because that would be ecologically unsustainable. So then what? You need, you know, and so there I go into these various kinds of ideas of planning in, a, in more centralized ways, but also even using the mechanism of the market, which we associate with capitalism and we think of as an impressive and inegalitarian thing, and it is in capitalism. Um, but that's primarily because the people who come into that market have wildly differing endowments of, of wealth. Your power in the market is proportional to the money that you have. You can imagine a world in which we essentially have equal amounts of you know, ecological credits that we can spend maybe on a new iPhone, maybe on a transatlantic flight, you know, and you, there's various ways of sort of adjudicating that in a way that everybody kind of gets their fair share, but you don't have to have a giant bureaucracy that tells you you can have exactly this much of this thing. Uh, and so I worked through that and I worked through some other th ideas about ecology and the, I, my sort of perspective on eco-socialism being one of like planning going deeper and deeper into the natural world. By which I mean, there's a certain kind of tendency in, in some strains of environmentalism to say that the problem is that humans have messed around with the, the earth too much and we need to withdraw and reduce our carbon footprint, all this kind of thing. And my, you know, my thing is that, well, no, we're, it's, it's, we're far beyond that. Uh, we have reshaped the earth in such fundamental ways carbon cycle, of course, as we know now, but now, now know very well in terms of the effects of, on climate change, but also the nitrogen cycle. There's all kinds of ways in which this planet is so fundamentally reshaped by human beings that the only way forward for us, if we want to keep it livable for us, is to plan it in, in a more rational and a more egalitarian way. Um, right. So I didn't fully understand, I think, even until I started giving these talks a lot, but that chapter is a chapter about planning. That's what it's about. Hmm. Um, Finally, we get to uh, the dystopian uh, spectacle, uh, the one that always scares the shit out of people. And I try to shy away from it because uh, I feel like it's easy to get, get caught up in dystopias. I mean, we see in our popular culture there's so many dystopian stories, the Hunger Games and things like that. And the reason that that resonates, of course, is because it resonates with things that happen in our society, but it's also, I think, the case that we, people seize on those things and sort of get invested in the doom and gloom idea that, well, I guess we're just doomed. And that absolves you of the responsibility to actually do anything. And part of the point of this book, for me, is to say, no, it's a space of possibilities. Some of those possibilities are terrifying, but the future is not written yet. It is written by us. But nevertheless, the logic of my two by two grid necessitates that I fill in the fourth box, where you have scarcity and you have a hierarchical class society. And here, so here the problem is, again, you don't need much human labor, you have your replicators, but uh, there's not, the earth can't support everyone having a very high standard of living. So, how does that look from the standpoint of the ruling class? Well, here I'm starting from a contradiction that is, a, you know, the, been the fundamental contradiction of capitalism since its inception, which is this relationship of mutual interdependence between the boss and the worker. By which I mean, the worker needs the boss because they don't have any other way to make a living. They don't have the means of production. They don't have the means of subsistence. 
The boss needs workers to run the factories, to run the shops. Uh, and so that it's in it's in the ten, it's in that in that conflict uh, that all that all the sort of the politics of, of capitalism as we understand it uh, you know arises from that. But if once again I'm if, I'm, if we're postulating a world in which those workers are no longer really needed in production, what, but uh, it's an ecologically scarce world, what does that mean from the standpoint of the ruling class? And it means all of these people are surplus people. They are superfluous populations. And so the first thing you can do is, you know, the rich can go off and hide in there gated communities on their private islands, you know, and they've got their robot security guards and their drones and their surveillance systems to protect them, you know, while the rest of us are off in, are in refugee camps or are in prison, um, you know. But at some point, you know, as long as we're around, as long as these, these rowdy masses are around, we're in danger. And so it's, that's the reason that this future is called exterminism. Uh, the term exterminism I stole from the British Marxist historian E.P. Thompson. Oh. He was using it to refer to the prospect of nuclear war, mm. uh, which is, well, post-Trump, I'm not going to say that I'm totally ruling that out as a possible dystopian mm. scenario, but uh, I sort of stole it for this other scenario <coughs> where basically the rich, it's, 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 a, gen it's a genocide against the non-rich, mm -hmm. uh, which could take kind of class, the classical, you know, Nazi-esque form, but it can just mean people are allowed to die of uh, preventable diseases because they don't have access to health care. It can mean people die in natural disasters because the, the state is not interested in uh, protecting them from that. It's a, you know, it's a genocide by neglect. And that's the end point of that particular feature uh, for me. Uh, and I talk about that through... Uh, you know, just, the literature of recent dystopian citation is enormous, so it's almost it's uh, almost too easy to find one. I end up using uh, the movie Elysium, uh, the movie in which the rich people all live in a spaceship where they have access to magical healthcare technology that allows them to live forever, and then everyone else lives down on the surface where they're all they're all non-white people except Matt Damon for some reason. <laughs> uh, and they, their job, their work, they're working, but they seem to do work that has nothing to do with the people in the spaceship. It's just like making the weapons that are then used to repress them. Uh, they're just a pure surplus population. Uh, and so that's the sort of the, you know, the precipice of exterminism that I'm, that I talk, that I'm sort of talking about in the book. So, so to close off, I guess. Uh, what I want, what I sort of try to reiterate at the end always is, again, that you know everyone always wants to ask me, well, which future are we going into, or which one is more likely, right? and that's not the point. Um, I paraphrase the great science fiction author William Gibson, who said, the future is already here; it's just unevenly distributed, <laughs> and all of these futures are here, and which ones we intensify and which ones we reduce is going to be dependent on the outcomes of the political struggles that we all engage in. Uh, that's, and so the point of the book is to sort of fire the radical imagination as we're all, as I am, as I'm sure you all are, engaged in the day-to-day -day struggles against, you know, whether it's a, a strike with momentum or it's your local, you know, political, you know, electoral politics or whatever it is, uh, to, to fire the imagination, you know, the dystopian imagination of this is what can happen if we lose, but also the hopeful imagination of we do have the potential to live in a much, much better world than the one that we live in. Uh, that's not a pipe dream. It's something that's blocked by by our politics and by our class structure, not by something inevitable about the world. So, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there, and then we can we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> we'll take a progressive stack. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I like this. It's really, I like it. But um, what I'm asking myself as you were talking is, you know, there's different little subgroups and subgroups and subgroups. I mean, some subgroups are really, you know, retreating from, you know, capitalist production, and they're living in small communities. Little, so 
I don't know if you want to address that or if that's part of this discussion, but you know, there this is not it's not like we're all this way and we're either this way or there is a you know, there are small groups of people throughout the world that are, you know, some are, you know, autonomous groups that are, you know, living sort of a communist vision and there are other ones that are sort of creating their own self so, and I think that's you made my point. Yeah. You want to I mean it's that's true, absolutely. Um, and it's certainly true even, yeah. I mean, on one level I would say um, capitalism particularly is such an integrated system that there's nothing that's that autonomous from it. Uh, but there are, to some extent, you know. And in terms of the sort of development out of capitalism in the various directions I've sketched, it's, you know, to use the, the Trotskyist phraseology, is combined and uneven is is the way in which these things develop. Well, to clarify, I really am thinking of indigenous groups and indigenous movements right. who are apart and separate. Right. But, and but are, how, who, how, who can you really point to that's really apart and separate? No, I would talk about the Zapatistas. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Um, but I mean, they're essentially in a movement of resistance against capitalism and the state. I mean, they are, they're very much a part of it in that sense, that they're, you know, that their political model is obviously quite different than the one that other, you know, insurgent movements have suggested. But it's it's hard. It's not as though they were able to secede really from global capitalism. And I think they understood that. Uh, so it's you know, I mean, in some ways, my you know, my kind of like utopian vision of of the communist future is one in which it is in fact possible for you know. You know, a million flowers to bloom, and for people to sort of actually articulate different ways of living that are truly autonomous. Uh, I think the global capitalist system that we live in, however, makes that very, very difficult. Uh, that's I don't know. Yeah. Well, before we get to communism, um, I'm just curious about it. It seems like uh, fascism is spreading and growing. There are uh, fascist movements throughout Europe. Uh, Duterte, if I'm saying his name correctly, in the mm -hmm. Philippines. Um, this seems to be a greater trend than uh, globally. I mean, even, even throughout Europe, even where the most extremist uh, right-wing uh, folks may not get into office, um, you're still having very conservative, business-oriented, uh, mild right-wing leadership. So is this a stage? Is this, because, um, I mean, even if you look at the Trump administration, they're all billionaires, they're, you know, they're all corporate. I mean, the American people don't, the average person has no idea who these people are, what they're real into. So I guess my question is, on the way to communism, what do you see is uh, happening now, globally, uh, not just in the U.S., but throughout the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally what we're seeing is the decomposition of the neoliberal political order that has existed for the past few decades. That the sort of traditional, you know, whether it's EU bureaucrats or Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, they don't have answers, they don't have a plan, they don't have a vision that is appealing to anybody. And yes, the right is more, is, has benefited more from that so far than the left has. Yeah, you can look at Trump or Duterte or the overthrow of Dilma Rousseff in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it's not as though there isn't also a counter movement. You know, Bernie Sanders happened, Jeremy Corbyn happened. You know, there. You know, we have a long ways to go. But I think both on the right and the left, these are reactions to the decomposition of that sort of. There is no alternative bureaucratic order that it now has has no answers to give people and has no real vision and no way forward. Which is again sort of the thing I start my book with is that. We, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not just going to be more of the same. It can't be more of the same. And I think that's all of the, the things I just just mentioned are, are indications of that fact. Um, this is really cool, and I'm curious where they live factors into this, and whether um, you have any thoughts on Snowpiercer as like this model of 
Uh, they live at Ansel. Okay, these are great ones. Um, well, so the They Live on the Flyer was John's idea. I completely endorse it because I love that movie. Um, and if you guys, yeah, anyone who uh, has not agreed to put on the glasses by the end of this talk is welcome to have a slow motion fight in an alley with me afterwards. Um, uh, uh, but seriously, actually, the, my favorite thing about They Live, which is sort of like a weird, like, side thing, but it, there's one scene where he puts on the glasses and sees all the sort of propaganda signs. So, I don't know, how many people in this room have, like, seen They Live? Alright, so a lot of people aren't familiar with the movie. It's a great cult 80s movie about um, a guy played by the wrestler Rowdy, Rowdy Piper who uh, discovers some magic sunglasses that reveal the fact that the ruling class of his uh, of 1980s America are actually space aliens. Uh, and that uh, advertising signs are actually all secret uh, capitalist propaganda signs that have like big block letter messages on them. Uh, and one, but so when he puts on the glasses, there's one scene where he said, where the sign actually says uh, something like uh, "work eight hours, sleep eight hours, uh, you know, play eight hours" or something, right? Which in his world is like a consumerist message. But that was a, originally a labor movement slogan. Mm -hmm. It was what they yeah. used to fight for the eight-hour day when they had to work when they had the ten-hour day, yeah. right? Um, and so I, I found that in a really interesting way in which, because one of the things I, I also talk about is how we need to put the idea of like just working less back on the left's agenda, including shorter hours. And so the idea that like by the 1980s, the idea of that, that labor, that work shorter hours slogan could be like reinterpreted as like a pro-capitalist slogan is like indicative to me about of how the labor movement fell down on pushing, you know, shorter hours. Um, so that's the day lived. Snowpiercer actually wrote a whole uh, review of that movie for Jacobin. Uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's a movie that I interpret as, a f a, again, related to the idea of not just demanding, you know, higher wages or more stuff under capitalism, but demanding a fundamentally different kind of a system. Uh, that, like, the train is sort of like, it's, it's capitalism. It's where you work your ass off and maybe you get a high wage or maybe you get a low wage, but all you can ever ask for is maybe a little bit better job, a little bit more money. You can't ask for just less work or no work or a non-capitalist you know, form of social organization. You have to get off the train in order to do that. Um, so it's, I, it, would, it would take too long to sort of go into any of that, but I did actually write up my thoughts on that. We usually try to go around. Okay, back. Yeah. Yeah. 20 years ago, um, the, the best chess players in the world could um, beat any kind of artificial intelligence. It wasn't even a question. And then 10 years ago, it started to become a battle that was on the network news every, every year when you know, the IBM computer would face off against the, uh, the great chess champion from Russia. And today they don't even bother to try because the artificial intelligence can defeat um, all humans by such a margin that they don't even bother trying any longer. Um, and that trend is just continuing. And it seems like maybe within the next 10, 20 years, um, it's very possible that we'll have artificial intelligence that's smarter than the, the smartest genius human um, who ever lived. And that artificial intelligence might be designing its own code. Um, and so from then on, um, you know, what's going to happen? And I'm just wondering what you, I'm sure you've thought about this yourself, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about having um, artificial intelligence that is more important than we have to be. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a big singularity guy. Um, yeah, mostly because, I mean, stuff like teaching a computer to play chess, it's a very specific, very easily kind of quantifiable domain. Once you start talking about, I mean, I don't really even believe in intelligence as a general concept. I think it kind of mystifies what it means to even be good at something or understand something. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not anticipating any time in the near future that we have, you know, computer programs that are, approach anything like what we would consider a human type of intelligence. Um, you know, so yeah, I don't, I thought about it, but I don't worry about it that much because I think it's not the issue. I think the issue is really much more to do with the the, 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 dumb, the dumb robots that can, you know, or the algorithms that can just do the things that you needed, you know, the you needed me to do before. Uh, That's interesting. So I thought that you know, when you're talking, you're talking about the socialism square. Um, 
that one of the things, because I, I respectfully don't agree with your answer um, about <coughs> intelligence, um, but we can plan, I guess, as, as humans, we can plan, um, and if we, you know, could get universal agreement to pass a law or something saying computers cannot exceed a certain level of capacity, you know, then we can solve that problem. But if we don't do that, then, um, you know, I mean, and I would be fine with such a law, because I think, I mean, again, I think it's basically relevant, because I just don't, I think that there, the idea that we're going to produce, you know, human-type, you know, consciousnesses is just not realistic in the, any short time frame. But, you know, anything's possible. I wouldn't be a science fiction nerd if I didn't think that. I wanted to explore a little bit more uh, the idea that this liberal neoliberalism is going to come to an end, because the way... I <laughs> this populist nationalist sentiment that's beginning to react against neoliberalism uh, by putting these demagogues and other people in power is going to be seriously modified by the needs of capital. And once capital is exported out of this country, uh, a lot of these false leaders are going to fall back into <coughs> the regulation and moderation of the economy based on the profit drive and the motive and oppressing the profit drive on other nations because that's the way people make money. So I also see there's a possibility that this neoliberal model will reemerge and continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, what's the timeline in your book? I could see this going on for another 50 to 100 years. Yeah, and I, I certainly don't pretend that I know what the timeline is. It's possible. I mean, I think, though, that what we're seeing now is indicative of the fact that people see the, the old sort of neoliberal style of regulation not working for them. And so you, something else has to, some other kind of, you know, mode of regulation has to arise, which, you know, in, in the right-wing populist variant, it uses racism and xenophobia and so on to cement a coalition that is, yes, fundamentally interested in capital accumulation and nothing else really, but that's but then that if you can cement that with a kind of a racist coalition, then that's one way to do it. Um, but what I you know, what I think is I don't I mean I don't really see, you know, kind of like Clinton Blair style neoliberalism making a comeback because I just don't see what it has to offer anyone except for a very small layer. Um, but what we will get, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I I, I kinda wanted to tease your brain about like about the line between communism and rentism and particularly what like um, for example what Ebenezer Howard noticed in Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards and the whole reason he did the whole uh, um, Garden City was that he realized that whoever controlled the means not of production but of transportation uh, controlled uh, everything and is even in post scarcity so I, I, um, I, I know in, in your book you, you you're Often talking about, uh, you know, we look at, we can see precursors of rentism in intangible objects and uh, absent uh, replicators where the production of goods is decentralized. Um, if, if production is still centralized and we still have to distribute, um, I guess like uh, automation is, obvi is an obvious thing, but then someone still has to maintain those automated trucks. So uh, I guess I wanted to see what you thought about how do we make sure that distribution remains democratic or at least not um, uh, not being able to fall into a ther authoritarian? So you're talking about like who sort of is in control of yeah. distribution. Right. So you imagine just like you know, like a rogue committee on the distribution of cheese. Well, and that's sort of where, I mean, that's sort of what the... And everything goes oh, all right. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, that's, that's actually like the socialism square for me because that's where we're talking about you know, I frame it in the ecological way, but you could frame it the way you did too, where there's a question of distribution. And yeah, you can't, people can't be fully autonomous. And so, I mean, I said that chapter is about planning, but it's also about socialist democracy. Because then the question does become how is that system administered? How is it controlled? Who is it accountable to? Right? The question of, yeah, the question of democracy is kind of inescapable there because, yeah. You can, I mean, particularly because, you know, I, I talk a little bit in the book about the sort of like how you can move from one of these futures to any of the other ones, right? In a situation, in a, in a, in a sort of socialist future, anybody who can get a hold of 
get control of, of resources, get control of distribution, that can be a click that turns it into the exterminant society, right? That's, that's that transition. So yeah, so then that, that becomes like a central political question in a society like that. So planning is the uh, wormhole from the gamut quadrant of socialism <laughs> to the alpha quadrant of rent. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I guess I want to challenge the idea of automation, you know, like everything, there's no work um, for several reasons. One is I, I, and we talked a little bit about this before, I think work is something, authentic work is something that gives life meaning for many of us. You know, people are creative and it, you know, if, if what you're doing has significance for others, there's also social beings, I think that that is part of it. Another thing, though, is that a lot of the work that exists is care work or interpersonal work or, you know, and that cannot be automated. I mean, teach, you know, education, mm -hmm. taking care of people. Um, I don't really disagree with either of those things. I mean, so the first one, um, to me, precisely, I'm, when I'm talking about eliminating work of the type of stuff you have to do to get a paycheck, Alien it's precisely work. to open up the space for people to do things and make the things that fulfill them and fulfill others. The care work one is a more complicated one. That's sort of one of those difficult sort of questions of communism that I allude to that doesn't go away uh, with capitalism is who does, how do we take care of one another? Who, who is responsible for that caring? How is it organized? Um, you know, that's at the sort of like micro level of like emotionally how we deal with one another. And then, you know, an education then is a is a complex one. It's an interesting one because, you know, I said like there's a lot of things that I think people get paid for and have to get paid for because they have to make a living. But the people do really find fulfilling and teaching is you know as a as a recovering academic, I know uh, lots and lots of people that really do like teaching, and they're doing it practically for free at this point. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a different way to sort of think about how these things could be organized if we weren't all fundamentally concerned with how are we going to get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, there's an interesting book about the Kellogg Corporation uh, which during the depression cut the hours of the workforce, um, I think to six from eight, and uh, it lasted for a long time. And I think until the 1950s or possibly the early 60s, in some places in the in the plant. Um, but one of the things that happened is that the women were the ones who wanted to keep it, but it was the men were kind of at a loss, I guess, I suppose, because they, they didn't have the caretaking responsibilities that the women did outside the, outside the workplace. Um, the, the men, actually, the ones that drove through dropping a shorter work week. And I wonder if you could, I mean, it seems to me that one of the things that we have to think about in terms of uh, an alternative to capitalism is that under capitalism, what automation means is a few people actually work longer hours and more intensively while the majority don't have any work at all right. the surplus population right. and why not go to a much shorter work week and equally distribute the work around I mean I don't assume you I, I realize, realize for the point of view of the book you assume no labor but I, I think there's always gonna have to be people doing sure. work um, or it doesn't have to be 80 hours a week yeah when you could be working 20 and uh, distributing the the you know, the work equally and, and the pay equally. Yeah, I mean, this is a complicated kind of cultural sociological question because, yeah, when you're talking about the difference particularly between, like, men and women, for example, as workers, is that, you know, it's a kind of, you know, for work, being a worker, you know, is like, is a kind of, for lack of a better word, an identity politics. It's like who you are. It's what makes you, you know, worth, you know, it's your source of worth as a person is right and if you and so it's like part of you know making the argument for shorter hours for universal basic income for a post work world is challenging that idea creating the idea that you can you could find your value and your worth in something else um and yeah i mean obviously in the real world i don't think you know the need for labor goes to zero but i do think that if we yeah if we start talking about reducing hours and sharing the work out equally 
that inevitably pushes us in a direction of a world where the job is not the fundamental source of our identity, which also is, I think, why it's such a politically dangerous idea to the bosses, because it's not just, you know, it's not just that they want, obviously they want everybody to work as many hours for as little money as possible, because that makes them money, but it's also workers who have time to organize, to read, to talk, to have a life outside of work are dangerous, you know. Um, and so the, uh, that sort of idea of like what defines me is, is, is my wage labor job is, uh, is a quite beneficial thing uh, for capitalism. And, and then, you know, I wish I had, you know, I write, I've written a lot about sort of challenging that idea. I wish I had better ideas about so how in a wider sense to do that as a sort of a propaganda point. I mean, like one of the examples I, I cite in the book is there's a study – because everybody, always, when I critique, you know, work and I make post-work arguments, people are like, oh, but people, you know, unemployment is so horrible for people. It makes them depressed and unhealthy and all these things. There are all these studies about how bad it is to be unemployed, part of which is just because you have less money. Which had not had, Being broke is bad for you. That's accurate. But it's also, there's a great study that was of some unemployed, older, it was a European study, some older workers who were unemployed and they had all these bad outcomes and they felt bad and all this stuff. And then one day... They crossed the threshold to where they were old enough that they were classified as retired. And then all of a sudden, the problems went away. They were just fine because they were no longer socially defined as workers. They were socially defined as retired people. So it's the cultural category that's the problem, not that like we somehow need to be working these jobs in order to be fulfilled. I see three trends happening in the world simultaneously. One is, I think... Climate change is rapidly worsening. I mean, world average temperatures are only increasing by like one one hundredth of a degree a year now. They're increasing by like one fifth of a degree now. And then the second trend I see is the what I call like the one percent cent or the one ten thousandth of the wealthiest. They're phenomenally wealthy and they use enormous amounts of resources. Think of like Trump or Mick Jagger or wealthy people who just waste millions of gallons of gasoline on their travels all the time and they're living like kings. And then the third trend is you got billions of people in the world who've got practically nothing. And these people need a higher standard of living and they have every right to it. And there's going to be a war between the people who have nothing and those very small group of people at the top. And I think that, um, I don't know how that's going to turn out, but I sure hope the ruling class is crushed. Right. And, I don't, and I think climate change is going to be the driving factor in this because climate change is going to get a lot worse. You just described the exterminist chapter of the book pretty much, so I don't have anything to add to it. Sorry. It's not funny. Yeah, great talk. I guess I, I, I don't see uh, much of the military in here. And, um, you know, so much of the robotics and the AI technology historically is just come from the military in particular, and um, um, I guess, you know, the uh, good old Lewis Mumford uh, kind of critiqued Marx's optimism about automation by, by pointing out that everywhere you see mass production, you always find mass destruction and, and the growth of Eisenhower's military industrial complex. Uh, still, still seems true today. So. Um, I guess that military wing of, you know, the, 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 thing, the, the thing that can, you know, what, what is it in Star Trek? Manifest in replicate. Replicate. Um, will be exploited by the military to such a great degree in parallel with any gains we might see that uh, I wonder how does that challenge your, your assumption of the replicator itself? Like, as a, wouldn't the replicator imply a, world with the military that's exploiting that shit it's all kind of bad you know I don't know so, yeah, yeah I mean I guess in my perspective that it doesn't imply it yeah. because I don't think that sort of the social structures are derived from technology in that way sure. certainly I think that I mean again the framework of my book is that if you are in a society that requires a course of state structure to enforce property relations then yes these technologies all get put toward re reinforcing that hierarchical property structure and that's what the sort of bottom half of my you know, a set of scenarios is about. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, uh, a few minutes ago you said that neoliberalism 
is basically gone and cannot come back. Don't you think uh, programs like uh, Universal Basic Income, which has made it uh, come back the past decade or so, and it will be only slight improvements of programs that uh, are current today, don't you think that it could make a comeback that way? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, or that, I mean, it would be it would be a very different type of system, but it would certainly have some of those features. I mean, the basic income thing is complicated because I do think I'm a supporter of basic income as a demand, but it's very tricky to not fall for the kind of right wing versions of it that want to, you know, liquidate the rest of the welfare state and mm -hmm. voucherize everything mm -hmm. and leave, you know, private the private sector in charge of healthcare and housing and all that. So, yeah, I mean, that would be. I mean, yeah, you could call that sort of a neoliberal, or I mean, I mean, that would be a, I mean, that would still be sort of a, like a pretty radically different form than we have today, but I certainly, there are certainly forces pushing that, and it's a, it's a debate we're gonna, gonna have to have because I think, well, not all of the ruling class, but much of the ruling class recognizes that they have to, you know, allow us to survive somehow, and the question is how that's going to be done. Um, I'm reading this book. Uh, I'm also reading uh, Thomas Frank's Listen to the Role, which is a lot talks a lot about the professional class. And I know your book is sort of not so much about automation as sort of assuming that it will happen. But I was I was curious, and you mentioned this in the book that the automation we've seen in the past is a little different than automation we're seeing now, and the fact that we're able to basically automate these professional class occupations. Um, and in the past, I'm no expert on the labor movements in you know before now, which I do some work in. But um, the uh, it sort of was like rendering people at the lower end of that class structure, uh, rendering them obsolete. Where the new automation is sort of rendering people at the you know the the, the sort of the middle people in that class relationship, the loop and pro real bourgeoisie like. Doctors, you know, health researchers or lawyers, people who see themselves as sort of uh, benefiting from this meritocracy. So I was wondering if you see um, or what your thoughts might be on automation, uh, sort of, you know, <coughs> altering those relationships and and sort of shaping the dialogue in, in in which we could talk about these in a different way than maybe we traditionally have. Yeah, I mean, there is a sort of, you know, it's just like a process of proletarianization that happens to a lot of these layers. You know, not just because of automation. I mean, again, going back to what, you know, my background in, in academia, I think you see a lot of, like, academic labor struggles that reflect the fact that, reflect the fact that these jobs are becoming sort of, like, rationalized and corporatized, and people are forced to see themselves as workers rather than some kind of special snowflake professional. And so, yeah, I think... Automation is not, is another thing that kind of pushes in that direction of people being forced to realize because it's not as though these sort of divisions of status didn't exist in industrial struggles. They're either between like craft workers and industrial workers and so on. But there's like some of these these forces can kind of push people to be forced to recognize their their class interests in a different way. Going back to uh, they live, I think that uh, that movie was about. It was anti-propaganda. It was about the truth. And the, the struggle was against the lie. Now, who's the determiner of the truth in, the, in any of these sets? You know? Um, the quality of money. Money is, uh, I think we have currency now. We don't have money. We don't have a fixed value. Um, within any structure, you're going to need some kind of currency to determine quality. I mean, right now we're undergoing a, a, a downgrading of food sources. And that is not being addressed by the media as wholeheartedly as it could be. Um, I just saw it within. 48 hours, that the average lifespan is, is declined. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we talk about equality versus quality, uh, no. 
and when, and when you go to McDonald's, you feel you just can't get bored. <laughs> Comments on quality? I mean, I don't know, it's sort of a tough one to respond to. I mean, I think measuring, sort of social systems of measuring quality are necessary. Um, my, my sort of perspective on it is that when you take it out of the capitalist framework, the system, the system of measurement you use is going to be different for food, say, than it would be for, you know, rating, you know, medicines, than it would be for rating books, you know. We, we're sort of, capitalism tricks us into thinking that one system, one, one, that there's only there's one scale that you can measure everything on, because capitalism has the one scale called money that you measure everything on. But there's no reason I, to think, I would say, that a society needs to measure everything on the same scale. That's, that's sort of the best answer I can give to that. too much control at this point over abundance versus scarcity as far as the ecology is concerned. I mean, is, is that half of the board basically getting smaller and smaller, or is the assumption that the super replicator machine would exi could exist and that we would be able to do that and somehow we'd all have access to it and there would be no negative impacts on, like, is there is there a maximum capacity for ecology in this scenario, or does it can it accommodate the super replicator machine for everybody and can we replicate everything? I mean, the thought experiment is that maybe we could. Um, certainly, we don't now have, I mean, we, I mean, I would say right now, you know, you're right that it's like a more, it's a less, it's sort of a more exogenous thing than the other axis. It's like more, it's like, you know, the, the class struggle axis is the one that is clearly just up to us. The other one is somewhat dependent on what kind of technologies we can come up with, what kind of strategies we can come up with for remediating climate change. I mean. But it is also somewhat political in that there are so many things that we could be doing and could be putting research into and so on that we're not doing. Um, so even if the extreme version of the perfect, you know, replicator-based society is not realistic, I still think it's useful to think along that spectrum of like how do we push it in that direction, given the technologies for renewable energy that we have now, ways of thinking about trying to remediate. Uh, carbon in the atmosphere that we have now, like how do we, how can we think in that direction? Because that stuff is, that stuff is obviously also political. Could you talk a little bit about the role of the state in determining uh, the, the direction that uh, we should be going to in light of the, uh, what you said before about how the state often enforces the divinity of private property um, how how could we look towards the state in a positive way? I'll give you one example. I used to represent workers in the Department of Transportation, the CSEA, and those workers are perfectly capable of taking care of the snowy roads and doing uh, bridge repair. Probably mutually, <coughs> they would have a lot less problems because they would know how to get proper training people to do the welding and the bridges. Where with management, there was always this competition for the better skilled jobs. So sometimes I contended that actually the Department of Transportation could be socialist um, if it was reshaped and people who were doing the work were rewarded with uh, handing over management prerogative to them as to what the mission is, how it's accomplished. Do you see any scenarios where that can be? Uh, exercised, or, or, do you, or do you believe that the whole state has to be uh, deconstructed before that can happen? I mean, obviously, it requires radical changes to the way that our state, the state is organized. But I think it's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, certainly, my sort of socialist future depends on the idea that we have things like that workers who are engaged in doing things like reconstructing our transportation system in the way that we need to if we're going to be. You know, in a in a car, you know, reducing carbon emissions and changing, you know, the way that we we get around. And you know, people talk a lot about worker cooperatives, sort of in the private sector, as a you know, as a new way, different way of thinking about organizing things. But I think it's interesting. I think it's an interesting thing you bring up that we could be thinking about that too. Uh, why 
why shouldn't sort of a, a government agency be organized as essentially a, you know, a worker cooperative? So, yeah. Do you see um, real dangers of fascism? And if not, um, is there a term that could be used to describe it's not just the Trump administration, I don't like to use those bureaucratic terms, but the uh, philosophy that um, he and the other billionaires represent. Like where do you, do you see, can we put a label on it or what? I, yeah, I mean, the ri them themselves are just, yeah, they're rich people that just want to do for themselves like, like all the others. The interesting thing to me, I mean, I don't have a complete answer to that. It's an interesting one and I've been thinking about it too. Uh, I started my tour for this book in, uh, in England and everybody, of course, was talking about Brexit and the, the far right in, in Britain. And, you know, the thing that it just came across to me is the way in which, um, you know, going to the, like, exterminism side of my scenario where the rich just want to sort of, like, keep what they got and screw everyone else, you know, in the medium term, how do you have a politics, if your politics is basically going to be shit for everyone but the 0.1%, how, how do you, in a somewhat democratic uh, society, get that over? And that answer is basically you offer to some segment of the working class well, you get to join us on our private island, literally our private island in the case of, uh, of Britain. Uh, and that's the racism and the xenophobia and all of that. I mean, I think that, and obviously in the long run, that working class is not going to work. It's not going to work out well for them either. But in the short run, that's how the ruling class keeps control. That would be my interpretation of it. I would just add, I recently uh, was in Great Britain, and um, this is before Brexit, shortly before and all you saw was what you see in the United States. Abandoned factories everywhere. Hundreds of miles, just abandoned, falling apart factories. And these are the folks that voted for Brexit. Yeah, so absolutely. So I can understand what's happening here, too. Yeah, a couple of questions. One is, in terms of exterminism, it seems to me the best example we have at the moment is the Israeli relationship with the Palestinians. They don't seem to even yep. want Palestinians as labor. No, I mean, I, I explicitly addressed that in the book, actually, where there's some research, like Adam Hania, who's a, a socialist a research, researcher, Palestinian, uh, who's written about this a lot, talks about the way in which it used to be more the case that the Israeli economy depended on actual Palestinian labor. And as they, they became less dependent on that labor, the relationship to the occupied territories mm -hmm. changed and became much more kind of yeah. exterminationist yeah. than it was before. Genocide. And the, the second question was, in turn, you seem to be well read in science fiction. I'm curious right, what the Soviet Union produced in terms of science fiction, in terms of, uh, are, are you familiar at all with that? Yeah, there's some all kinds of interesting ones. The Strugatsky's Roadside Picnic is probably the the one that immediately springs to mind. It's a fascinating, um, it ended up being sort of read a, later on as a parable of Chernobyl, but it was from before that, uh, about uh, aliens who like leave behind sort of inscrutable and sometimes useful but also dangerous artifacts mm -hmm. that the people have to try to, you know, figure out how to deal with. It's a, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that one, that's the first one that comes out. I mean, I'm not extremely well read in, in Soviet science, but Eastern European science researchers like, uh, Science fiction is also, in general, has produced some interesting stuff. Stanislav Lem would be would be the big name there. Who, you know, of course, these things have this sort of like Kafkaesque fascination with bureaucracy for the obvious reasons of the context in which they were produced. But uh, yeah, no, there's a uh, and then and another thing that I do you make use of in the book, which is not from Soviet Union, but is sort of speculative, sort of past speculative fiction about. Uh, the Soviet Union is Francis, uh, Francis Spufford's Red Plenty, which is essentially a book about the debates about economic planning in the Soviet Union and the mathematicians who were trying to figure out uh, what the feasibility of, of a planned economy was. And he like somehow managed to make this a very engaging, uh, uh, dramatic narrative. So I, I recommend that as well. There's always Yevgeny Zamyatin's We. There's that one too, yeah. Precursor to 1984. Right. Uh, I, uh, well, one quick addition, to, uh, and, the, and then what I wanted to get to about um, uh, Palestinian labor in Israel is one really sad fact is that the one value add that they do provide that they are 
required to give to the Israeli economy is that they are targets for their military Weapons. industrial yes. progress. And that is advertised no, in, absolutely. In, you know, in, in, in those companies' uh, right. materials. Like, this has been battle, like, all of our stuff's been battle tested mm -hmm. in maintaining uh, exactly. apartheid. But um, I, I was going to, uh, 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 a radical shift there. Um, to my question is, um, uh, I, 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 my, my re recurring thought experiment is um, how bored I would be in the Star Trek universe, like how much I love the show, but then like, mm -hmm. like w what, why I would show up to a restaurant in New Orleans because I literally have nothing else to do with my life, right? And, and how square everyone would be. And I'm and I'm uh, and I'm wondering uh, like what um, what and, and uh, attached to that like um, in um, uh, the dispossessed in Le Guin's mm -hmm. dispossessed you know like the, the removal of all possessive uh, forms of um, of uh, vocabulary and I'm just uh, wondering what um, sort of the more um, interpersonal if you have any, anything to say about the more interpersonal dynamics of the um, sort of the upper side of, of your quadrant, like the top yeah. square. Yeah, I mean, that is sort of what I try to get into in that in the, the communism chapter, because I think, you know, yeah, there, I do get that that sort of like, well, won't, won't it be boring, <laughs> uh, you know, question. And, you know, what, what, what if, you know, people need sort of conflict to, you know, and I, my first reaction is, you know, pe human beings are extremely good at creating conflict. I'm really not that worried about that. Uh, but it's, you know, it's also just that, like, there's so much that we do now um, that is, you know, competitive and, you know, that is not, but that is not, you know, directly capitalist, right? Like, I want to be good at, like, the video game I play online. I'm going to get paid for that. I want to be good at playing the guitar. You know, like, that's just... That's, that's, you know, what I do when I have the time to do the things that I want to do. It's like, it's, there's a, there's sort of conflict and competition inherent in it, but it's not, you know, it's not of a capitalist sort. I mean, I don't remember exactly, something you said sort of made me think of the conversation we were having about the Star Trek world and the sort of square, or the squareness of it, because we were talking about this at dinner, uh, how it's so, it's, a, it's very sort of like forward looking in terms of its political economy. But then it's like, it's sort of like in terms of like sex and gender, it's like completely conservative. Like everything is exactly the same as in the 1980s. Um, and so like, yeah, like you need like, you have to imagine like a more like queer Star Trek to get like a picture of like the fun version of that universe, I think. <laughs> I don't think in and of itself that will disrupt the capitalist system, partly because now the open source software ecology is itself a kind of an appendage of uh, the for-profit software industry in a lot of ways. The people that are, people are paid by private software developers to write code for the big open source so uh, software projects because they're essentially a kind of shared infrastructure that a lot of these companies depend on. Um, you know, so this is one of those things where I would identify certain types of kind of open source, you know, and free <laughs> software communities as, you know, good illustrations of sort of communist impulses, but not things that in and of themselves without like radical political changes are going to sort of like undermine the capitalism uh, system. Like a broader sense, like sometimes, you know, there are ways now to get all the entertainment you want without paying time yep. for uh, people get hacked into you know companies and steal their information, you know, without without needing capital necessarily. Um, you know, not just the open software, but yeah. But then you know, if, they, if that becomes too big of a problem, this is where the uh, coercive arm of the state becomes useful. Uh, I open my chapter on rentism with a fictional vignette from Charles Strauss about a guy on the run from the copyright police, and then that goes into discussion of Aaron Schwartz who killed himself after being prosecuted for downloading academic journal articles. Right. Um, so, you know, and this, so the, the surveillance and coercion can always tamp that down. Maybe it's because I just watched the Edward Snowden biopic last night that that's particularly top of mind. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I think that's where that leads if it's not part of some larger social transformation. Uh, yeah, maybe to look, add to a little bit about the, the idea that the, the communist model might be a little boring. Um, <laughs> I visited Cuba last winter, as did a couple other people here in the room. 
And what I saw, the, what, what, the, the square you have up there that says socialism, I mean, I saw a lot of egalitarianism there, a lot of equality, you know, in the midst of, of a good deal of scarcity. And there's a part of me that finds that attractive. Um, I find, for instance, in Cuba, people were a lot more creative mm -hmm. in the way they solve problems because they just can't run down to uh, uh, Walmart and, and buy something when they need it. Right. And, and so I'm thinking, is, if people have, like, enough to eat and excellent medical care, which they do in Cuba, mm -hmm. why do they need a lot of toys to play with when they can just make their own toys? I mean, it's an it's an interesting question, and it's sort of a it's sort of a like a philosophical one that's maybe irresolvable. I think toys are cool. That's my that's my view of it. And that when you have them, you find other weird and interesting things to do um, that are not just buying stuff off the shelf. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's but again, but a, that does go to the point that a materially limited world can still be a very good one, and we can still have very good lives there if it's an egalitarian social system. Yeah, I mean, I did. I'm not. I'm not an expert on Italian politics, so I'm not really qualified to to speak to it that much. I mean, the Five Star Movement, I think, is quite. It's certainly. I wouldn't necessarily compare it to the Green Party. It's quite a bit less coherent ideologically, and I don't even think the Green Party is that ideological really <laughs> coherent. No offense. Um, but uh, but yeah, actually, Jackman has published a couple of things about that referendum that I would I would look at. I mean, I think what it reflects is sort of the thing we were talking about earlier about the base just rejection of the established neoliberal order more than anything else and which what that's going to end up meaning in a right or left direction is to me really unclear at this point. Uh, yeah, could you talk a little bit more about how the, you said in the socialism square quadrant, quadrant uh, more planning in the you know, democratic social democracy. Uh, can you talk a little more about how, how you see that working? I mean, it's I basically just see it as a, I mean, some of it is, you just need a, some sort of centralized way of dealing with how, how do we kind of share our scarce resources. And some of that might mean something like, you know, we were talking earlier about transportation infrastructures, like we're going to build, are we going to like actually build some high speed trains and do stuff like that? You know, if we're going to convert, you know, we're converting over to, you know, wind and solar and, you know, Hydropowered, like doing all of that kind of stuff, and then there's this, and then there's the thing I talk about in terms of market mechanisms of if we if we have our replicators, but we can only sort of replicate so much, 
um, and, or there's like certain different scarce resources, you know, different rare minerals or whatever that we have to sort of allocate. What mechanism? Somebody has to decide, you know, what is the quota, and then set up a system so that people can, you know, decide what you know, just pick and choose. Like, what do I want to replicate, or what do I not want to replicate, given my my rations for this my month, right? I, the, you know, it's like. That's the uh, that to me is kind of the it becomes the central issue if we're talking about a world where it's not about we're not worrying so much about allocating labor we're talking about alloc- basically organizing consumption rather than production that there has to be some kind of equitable way of organizing consumption and of course then that becomes complex because people have qualitatively different needs and you know it's not enough to just say everyone gets exactly the same amount because you know it's but yeah, I don't I don't go too far down that road. But those are the kinds of questions that I think have to get asked in the in that scenario. Oh, I just had a uh, comment question about like, the stability of rentism. Um, it seems as though, like you were saying, socialism is kind of like the planet of consumption, and rentism it almost seems like the only type of class struggle that you could have in a system like that would be. Uh, self-imposed restrictions on consumption. So say you would just stop replicating things that cost you, you know, whatever kind of uh, currency or, or, or money. You know, like in time, it might be lifespan or, or whatever it might be. Um, but it seems as though where socialism would be kind of a uh, organized to maintain its stability based on cooperative planning, and rentism, that struggle could either force uh, those in power towards exterminism or towards an acceptance of like a type of communism because of the abundance, but also because of the hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, I sort of, and I, I say in the book that I think it's an unstable system because of it, because of the things you just said, and also just because of the economic problem of like, how do you people get enough money to pay their licensing fees when they don't, when there's no, not enough jobs? Um, so I think it is unstable. I mean, I think it's you know. It would be an, obviously an advertising saturated society, given the need to get people to consume things. The day, the, the, the day you live society is kind of like a rented society, probably. I would say, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I agree fundamentally. It's not. I mean, none of them are stable in some, or at least certainly the sort of the dystopias are not stable. Um, actually, at the, I mean, the weird the weird O'Henry, O'Henry ending is that at the end, exterminism turns into communism. Um, because once you've killed off every all the excess population, then you just you know just decommission all your murder drones and whatever, and then you just forget that all happened, and then you congratulate yourself on your wonderful communist society. So, you know. the time machine, right? Where you it's have all the what do they call them? The Eloy uh, up top. They're all nice. And happy, right. right? Yeah. <laughs> but they were they were dependent on the people the down below, though. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like you couldn't get. Right. Because you can't really get rid of labor. Something has to be done. Right. Hmm. Well, where would religion fit into this discussion? It's a, it's a, a very value-oriented uh, um, organizational structure throughout the world uh, to the point where, you know, it's in control of governments who exterminated all the leftists. Where where does religion fit in this? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I have a great answer. That I have never been a religious person. I don't really have the talent for a religious thought, except in the fact, in the degree that the idea, the sort of the utopian vision of a post-work, post-scarcity world, is my religion. Um, so. You know, I don't know. I, I, I would, I would say you can sort of imagine. You know, it's a cop out, but you can imagine for yourselves how different religious modes of thought kind of can motivate or can gra- be grafted with these various different kinds of societies. I don't know. Other questions? Well, I want to thank our speaker. Thank you.